you have to begin to see what Nixon's plan was after the, the election. And there you get a better sense of his view that this is the last time that we're going to be able to take on the centralized bureaucratic apparatus and be able to hold it back. John, if, um, if Richard Nixon were a character in a Western, who would he be? Simon <laughs> Legree? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, uh, I don't know. In, in, a, in a John Ford Western? Yes. Maybe a Mose Harper or something. <laughs> <laughs> hard to cast, uh, Yeah, he would, I would be think. hard to cast. Uh, this is a, a complicated figure in many ways. Well, what, what should we... Um, particularly, what should conservatives think about Richard Nixon? He was certainly not beloved by the American right wing no. at the time when he no. was president, or even before he was no. uh, president. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of disappointment, obviously, at how his presidency ended. Sure, sure. But what, uh, you're, you're uh, a man who's uh, who studied that period. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you uh, what do you well, make I, of him in retrospect? I think Nixon was at the center of the two greatest controversies in the post World War II period. Nixon comes out of the war, runs as a Republican from uh, California in 1946, in a time when politics is dominated by Roosevelt and the and the New mm -hmm. Deal. It's a time when. Uh, Socialism, communism, uh, uh, the, 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 many of the intellectuals in America were very uh, 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 willing and, and uh, very hospitable to socialism. And it was hard to draw a line between socialism and communism. Mm -hmm. And it was harder still to draw a line between the, 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 uh, 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 the communism that was backed by the Soviet Union. Uh, and its influence in America. Now, I think Nixon brought the problem of domestic communism to the fore mm -hmm. in American politics in a way no one had done. And that earned him a great deal of enmity in the Hiss uh, case uh, and in the way in which he brought uh, that to the attention of the American people. Because you, when you look at the 1930s, you look at American intellectuals, Many of them were, were very willing to extend the, the, the powers of American government uh, uh, far beyond anything that had ever been done. Nixon, Nixon was still in many ways, even though he thought that government should be powerful, I think he was an opponent of, however he understood it, administrative centralization mm -hmm. because he knew that it would be difficult to hold political officers accountable once the power moved from the, po the political to the administrative realm. So Nixon's other, the other thing that he brought to the fore is I think he's the first real systematic opponent of the New Deal in, a, in American politics. Not in a, in, a, in a really coherent way, but in a way, let's put it this way, if you look at Eisenhower's presidency, Eisenhower did not want to politicize mm -hmm. the New Deal. He did not want to politicize what it was that Roosevelt had done or what the Democratic Party had right. done, uh, even expanded it. I mean, what, what Eisenhower called modern republicanism was really republicanism that had made its peace with the New Deal. Yeah. And in fact, he expanded in a way that even the New Deal didn't when he created the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. That's right. Because mm -hmm. you remember, the New Deal was preoccupied still with, with, with national defense, and many of the resources, or most of the resources of the federal government were still used primarily in terms of defense. Once you start the, po the, pro the possibility of creating federal monies for health, education, and welfare, mm -hmm then of course you, you're moving in a direction toward changing the priorities of, of those who, are, who hold offices in America because you have the possibility of subsidizing constituencies. Nixon was 
In other words, what, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is Nixon understood. In fact, he said the election of 1960, in his mind, that the, the, was election, the, was the, uh, um, the election was about whether or not we want a free society or bureaucratic society. Mm -hmm. He said John Kennedy will usher in a bureaucratic society. He wanted to retain a free society. Now, that becomes obscured by the time he becomes president in <laughs> yes. 1968. Well, but it, isn't it obscured in part by Nixon himself? Uh, I mean, he, he is yeah. responsible for a lot of federal bureaucracy in his yeah. terms as president. Yeah, I think the, the, the problem with Nixon and the, the difficulty of understanding Nixon is Nixon's two terms are like two different presidencies in my mm -hmm. view. When Nixon won in 1968, the fundamental preoccupation of the, of the country and his mind in the White House was winning the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. There was no way in which he could negotiate with large majorities in Congress without accommodating many of the things that they, that they wanted to do and could have done probably even uh, over veto. Mm -hmm. Much of what he did in his first term was to try to uh, uh, fund the war in Vietnam. Now, the key was the 1972 election. Now, even the New York Times in 72 said, after, after Nixon's election, it, what Nixon did was extraordinary in American politics. It's as if another party took power, because remember what he did? 1972, when he took office, he, he told every member of his administration, including Henry Kissinger, every cabinet officer, you have to turn in your resignations. He said, I'm tired of appointing people to offices and then getting them co-opted by the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. I want people that are going to do what we have to do. And so his, you have to begin to see what Nixon's plan was after the, the election. And there you get a better sense of his view that this is the last time that we're going to be able to take on the centralized bureaucratic apparatus and be able to hold it back. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because uh, it's true that the, the left feared that side of Nixon, that yeah. plan of his. Uh, they thought this was the beginning of the administrative presidency or the, yeah. uh, you know, the sort of... Uh, the imperial presidency. The imperial yeah. presidency yeah. working its way from foreign policy into domestic, control of domestic policy as well. But what's, what's the evidence that he, he was thinking strategically? He did have this, you know, this, uh, what you just pointed, pointed to, um, a plan to form super departments oh, yeah. combining yeah. some of the existing cabinet departments. And the theory, I guess, was that he would be able to control them, the president would be able to control now, them what more. What he wanted to do in creating the, the distinction between departments is, is isolate what you would call the pork departments, mm -hmm. the, those departments that, that were more concerned with, uh, with uh, uh, satisfying constituencies, and those departments that were more concerned with the national interest. Mm -hmm. In other words, he wanted to isolate those people that he was certain would be co-opted by those bureaucracies that, that provided So health, service, education, and welfare, right, for example. Any of those kinds yeah. of departments. And he also wanted to reorganize the bureaucracy in such a way as to cut the link between the congressional oversight mm -hmm. committees and their links to Congress, assuming, of course, that, that Congress would do it, which, of course, they, nobody in Congress would, would do what he wanted to do when he sent the Reorganization Act over. What he thought he could do he, is could he do it administratively? Mm -hmm. And that's when, of course, he, he got into trouble. But here's what, here's what Theodore White says about the, that problem at the time. Nixon knew that the only way to decentralize power in Washington was to centralize authority in the White House. Mm -hmm. But then he opened himself up to the charge of the imperial presidency. Nixon's ultimate intention, though, was centralized with the view to decentralizing, getting it out of Washington. Mm -hmm. That he failed at. That's what Watergate partly was about. But isn't uh, instituting wage and price controls a strange way well, to yeah, decentralize those, authority those, in Washington? No, no, but, but you have to remember, those are in the heat of an election. Those are, those are temporary measures, I think. Look, Nick, you have to win elections, too. <laughs> I know, but that's a, isn't that a, 
a strange way to win an election? Well, I mean, is he, this he a, did win. This though, is not remember? the usual way to <laughs> win an American election. I think I, it, they thought that worked in the short uh -huh. run. It certainly did for in seventy by in seventy. Well, there's a certain argument if you're going to have wage and price controls, you should have Republicans running them. I mean, <laughs> conservatives, no, conservative I, look, economists I would who make, hate what they're doing. Yeah, administering. I these think things. Nixon made a lot of errors of, of judgment, prudential judgment. I try to understand him in this context of, mm -hmm. of what was going on in Washington, and how was he perceived? How was he understood? Uh, I think the man who understood Nixon best in terms of what he was doing was Reagan. Mm -hmm. Reagan already understood it in 59. They start a correspondence with each other in, in 1959. In Nixon's presidency, when he was president, you can listen to the tapes, whenever he, all of the important things that he did, whether in Vietnam, he would always call Reagan, he was governor, mm -hmm. and he'd, he'd tell him, this is what we're doing right now, and he'd say, I'll, I'll let Henry tell you the details of uh -huh. it. Uh, you, right. you notice Nixon was destroyed politically, and, and just almost anybody that touched him after he resigned. Well, but who met him at the airport when he came to California? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. So Reagan was the only guy, I think, who knew what Watergate was about, really. But you can't make a public defense of Nixon anymore. Do we know what Watergate was about? Well, I don't think he did. Nixon I don't think did. Nixon did. In fact, when I wrote a paper in 1984 on the role of, water, of the bureaucracy in Watergate, uh -huh. somehow it got into Nixon's hands. And within a couple of weeks, he wrote me a letter and said, uh, you know, I never thought about that, th that element of the... Of Is that the, right? Of the, and he said, I, you're far away. He said, you, you weren't even here. And, and, <laughs> and you, you pointed to something, really, about what was happening, and I, it wasn't really a defense of Nixon, it was just, there are institutional players, there are people who have certain things that they want to do, and, and I was trying to take into account the broader, the, uh -huh. more, the, 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 the forces in American politics. Well, say more about that. So what, Not the what, personalities. What was your argument? The argument was, of course, that the permanent government, the, bureau, bureau, the bureaucracy, was well aware that Nixon was a fundamental opponent. Mm -hmm. All of the, 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 the bureaucracy uh, uh, thought of Nixon as a threat, including the, the intelligence agencies. All of them thought of Nixon as a, as a threat. And so whenever uh, the bureaucracy is threatened, it defends its interests by going to the media, mm -hmm. by leaking to political oppon opponents, all of Watergate's so-called revelations that were supposedly done by, by Woodward and Bernstein as, as through investigating, that wasn't investigative reporting, that was, that was just so, using what somebody gave them. Soaking up the leaks. Right, yeah. right. And so the, the, what you can see subsequently in, in, in looking at the bureaucracy in relationship to the parties, Republican presidents can never do with the bureaucracy what Democratic presidents can. Democratic presidents are shielded by the, demo the bureaucracy. Yes. Republican presidents are undermined by the, by the bureaucracy if they perceive them as a threat. So in the Nixon period, what the bureaucrats feared was not politicization of the bureaucracy. They, uh, I mean, they feared uh, a conservatization, or they feared a, a particular kind of political authority over the bureaucracy. They feared, I think, the, the, the view that you would revitalize various of the problems that had been brought to Washington to be decided by centralized bureaucracies, that you decentralize them and much of the power and decision making, real politics in mm -hmm. other words, mm -hmm. goes back to the states. Because once you centralized administration in Washington, everything revolved around the center and the congressmen had to uh, make their reputations not by a defense of of their, their constituencies within the state. Senators didn't look out for the interests of the state within the state. Right. Everybody thought you deliver the goods from the Senate. So the bureaucracy was, was acting from uh, 
uh, organizational maintenance uh, yeah, of course. motives. And, and, that and everybody... They feared all, loss of power. Right. Yeah. And all of those forces in Washington that benefited from centralization, which includes, by the way, the cent uh, national media, national economic interests, all of them would prefer to have to deal one place. You would say that's true of the national security bureaucracy as well, or primarily well, the national the security the bureaucracy hated Nixon for other reasons that were related to the Vietnam War. Remember, he was gonna, he was actually going to uh, uh, put one of his admirals on trial for treason. There, Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I don't remember uh, that. And they talked him out of it. Uh -huh. uh, the, 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 I, I, I don't know that we have full knowledge of what was going on in that period, but a lot of things were going on. So they hated him for, for other reasons as well, the, the, the national security and the CIA bureaucracy. But what you had by the 19, uh, what you had by the Nixon administration is, first of all, the, 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 the official bureaucracy was often co-opted by by the, the committees in Congress that ha had control over those things for a long period of time. Just one example. When Nixon made the opening to China, normally you would think you would do that through the State Department. That's what it's set up for. <laughs> Nixon did it absolutely without anybody in the State Department, including the Secretary of State, William Rogers, who was not informed about the opening of Ch to China until about two hours before Nixon went on television. So and Kissinger did it all. It was all done through the National out Security of Council pocket, yeah. out of the White House, though. Yeah. Yeah. So what you see is these presidents had to create their own bureaucracies that were loyal to them to go against the permanent bureaucracies that were in the hands of, the, of the, those people in Congress who had tenure for long periods of time. Right. And thus were disloyal to them as president. Right, yeah. and responded really to the interests of those people that they know they'd have to deal with for, for 30 years, not four years or eight <laughs> yes. years. Right. So it was it, the, the relationship between the branches, the, the Congress and the presidency. Once administration was centralized and Congress ceased to be a, a, able to understand itself in terms of lawmaking, in terms of the national interest, it became really a force for delegating great power to the administrative apparatus and become an oversight body. And so it's very difficult for it to think in terms of a, a, of a national interest. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of, the, one of the Lincoln fellows yesterday saying, you can't get some congressman to talk about a national security problem because, oh, I'm, I'm concerned with energy. <laughs> now, this is a congressman. <laughs> As if, He's, yeah. uh, uh, so each picks his own policy arena right. to be able to be a major player. And the problem with the presidency, of course, is there's a lot of major players in minor areas. Right. But you need to have major players in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the representative branch, in the, in the deliberative branch of the government. You need to have coherent policy that's made by the body. And that doesn't happen. Congress as a body. As a body. Yes. And you get to the point, you get to the kind of absurdity you see right now. The, the American Congress is held, uh, uh, it, it, its public approval rating is 11%. But look at uh, every person, 90% every, of incumbents still get reelected. <laughs> that means that the fate of the body is different than the fate of the individual member. The people don't judge the body. They judge their member. That's right. You like your congressman. You hate Congress. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. But that's not a good way to keep the, the, the government of the United States accountable. And that's what Nixon, I think, saw. Nixon thought, and he says this, when if it's going to be impossible for the people to be able to, to, uh, to consent to government when they don't have access to the people who have real power. Mm -hmm. And that is a big problem. How to deal with that problem, of course, is the problem of the administrative state. Right, and popular government turns into unelected yeah. power. Right, because as government... Agencies as, and commissions, bureaus, and right. so forth. Yeah. As Congress has to delegate more power to specialized bodies, they don't have the kind of expert knowledge, the technical knowledge. And they give more, and more and more of the decisions are, are crafted by the people that are in those, uh, those technical fields. And, and so Congress can 
doesn't even attempt to, to do the actual making of the, law, the, the rules or regulations that establish right. what you can do and what you can't do. It just, it just enables the bureaucracy to do those kinds of things. And so uh, it shields the bureaucracy in a way. And it, it, and it makes it impossible for the people to hold the representatives accountable as a body. Right. And you have the situation that we have that, that the American people are, are almost impotent when it comes to getting to the sources of, of, of what constitute real power. And thus controlling their own government. Right. The powers, really, the rules and regulations, the things that pass for laws are not really general laws anymore. Right. Right. These are particular laws, and people can get particular favors or privileges through these administrative bodies, but you don't get good general legislation. You don't get the rule of law, because a, a law should be a general law, and it should apply equally. But these are all ways of, 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 of enabling unequal treatment. Mm -hmm.